Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this uh, webinar on good practice for transferring data. Uh, I'm going to talk about what best practice is for transferring data off Archer and the RDF. Uh, this will hopefully be useful to some of you because uh, Archer is reaching the end of its service and I'm sure there are many of you who want to uh, transfer their data safely off Archer. Uh, I also have with me, there are a couple of the moderators in chat, uh, Andrew Turner and Lorna, who will be helping me today. They'll be uh, helping to answer any questions that pop up in chat. So feel free to ask questions and either I or Andy or Lorna will answer them. Uh, so firstly, just uh, some detail about the Creative Commons license. Uh, this just has some details about the uh, the things, the requirements for uh, reusing or redistributing uh, these slides. Uh, so this session is being recorded and it will be made available on the Archer YouTube channel within a couple of days. And the slides and recording will also be available on the Archer website. So we'll just start with some useful links. Uh, these are if you if you don't have time to listen to the whole talk, then most of the information in this talk will be contained in one of these links. Uh, so the first one is the data management guide. Uh, this has information on all the tools available on Archer for archiving and for transferring files, most of which we'll go over in some amount of detail in this talk. Secondly, we have the user guide. Uh, the user guide has uh, descriptions of the file systems available on Archer and the RDF and also their uses and limitations. And then lastly, there's a link to Globus Online. Uh, Globus Online is a parallel transfer tool, which we'll be covering later. Okay, so here are just some, uh, is just a summary of the main takeaways uh, that we're going to get from this talk. So the first one is when you're transferring data, you want to combine small files into large archive files before transferring. This is probably the most important bit of information from this talk, and I'll be referring to it many times uh, throughout the course. Uh, secondly, make sure you are using the right tool. There are a few tools available, both for archiving and for transferring, and it's important to understand their pros and cons. Uh, for example, we have rsync, which is a very uh, commonly used transfer tool. It's very useful, but it does have a lot of overheads uh, because of some of the uh, operations it performs. And a lot of these operations are unnecessary for a lot of you. So it's important to know what these are so that you know whether it's worth you using it or not. Secondly, it's important to know whether a parallel data transfer tool is really required. Uh, they are very powerful. Uh, including Globus Online, the one I mentioned earlier, uh, but they can often be overkill and more, more trouble or, uh, than they're worth for small transfers. Thirdly, watch out for compression and encryption overheads. So a lot of uh, archiving or transfer tools will do one of these two things by default, so, but often these are unnecessary and will add overheads to your process and uh, essentially make everything take longer than it should. So it's important to know which tools perform these functions and whether it exactly you need the functions or not. And lastly, be aware of the weakest link in the transfer chain. So this can be important when you're transferring data off Archer or the RDF to your own personal system. Uh, they, Archer, the RDF, both have very high bandwidths, uh, about 10 to 20 uh, gigabits per second. But if you're transferring to your laptop over Wi-Fi, then the limitation is uh, almost certainly going to be your Wi-Fi connection. So it's important if you are striving for better performance in some aspect that you know what exactly is limiting your transfer speed. So this is just a brief overview of the subjects I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover the file systems that are available on Archer and the RDF, uh, combining files or archiving, which, uh, as I mentioned already, is uh, an important thing to do for transferring, uh, how to copy data 
from Archer to the RDF and vice versa, and how to copy data from the RDF to your local machine and vice versa. So the Archer and RDF file systems. There are two file systems available on Archer. There's slash home, which is backed up. It's available on the login, serial, and service nodes. The login and serial nodes, if you're a, a, a user who's familiar with Archer, that you're probably familiar with these. The service nodes you may not be familiar with, they just provide some functions uh, in between the login nodes and the compute nodes, like the PBS job launcher is run on the service nodes. Uh, the file system is NFS, which is not a parallel file system, which uh, can inhibit its performance somewhat. And this is part of why it's not mounted on the compute nodes, as uh, if it were mounted on the compute nodes, then users would be writing to it directly uh, from their jobs, which would slow down performance considerably. Then there is slash work, which is not backed up. Uh, it is a Lustre parallel file system. Lustre has excellent performance for large files, but it is not very good for small files. Mm -hmm. So this, again, is part of the reason that we encourage archiving small files into a larger archive file. And it's available on the login, serial, service, and compute nodes. And then on the RDF, the files on the RDF are backed up only for disaster proofing. So this means that if you accidentally uh, delete something on the RDF, we won't be able to recover it. It's backed up in snapshots in case uh, something, some sort of disaster happens that destroys part of the uh, part of the machine. Uh, we are able to back up from one of those snapshots. Uh, the file system is GPFS, which is General Parallel File System, uh, which you might know by its slightly more updated name of Spectrum Scale. Then the RDF has three file systems, which are uh, which one you use will generally depend on your funding body. So we've got a, a EPSERC, NERC, and a general system. And these are directly mounted on the login and serial nodes. It also has two data transfer nodes, uh, which are shown there. And these are the nodes that you should use when you're transferring data between the RDF and a remote machine. You can access these using your usual uh, Archer username and password. The RDF also has a data analytic cluster. So uh, this cluster doesn't have a particularly wide bandwidth, but it has a scheduler that you can use for scheduling long running tasks, such as for archiving and compression. Um, so it's useful essentially for tasks that you don't want to run interactively. You just want to set them going and leave them running perhaps hours or days in the background. So archiving files. This is very important for transfer performance because as we mentioned earlier, the file system performs well with small numbers of large files, but not with large numbers of small files. So this is just a small example to show why archiving is so important and the difference it can make to your, your transfers. Uh, so the, the general motivation is that uh, if you have many files, there are a lot of metadata operations to uh, for each individual file and for the connections between them, uh, but there are a lot fewer if you have one single large file. So in this example, we have 23 gigabytes of data spread across approximately 13,000 small files, ranging from 32 kilobytes to 5 megabytes. And as we can see from the results down at the bottom of the time command, copying this data from a somewhere on the uh, login node to uh, slash general on the RDF takes uh, just under an hour. And here is the same data transferred in a single archive file instead. So again, say, same data transferred to the, from the same place to the same place, but it's now all archived in a single file. And we can see that it now takes only slightly over three minutes, which is obviously a huge improvement over the hour for the original data. 
Now there is some overhead for this you, because the process of creating the archive doesn't come for free. It take, in this case, it took approximately 15 minutes, but even adding on this 15 minutes, it's still uh, a huge time save. And almost more importantly, you only need to do the archiving once. For example, a common workflow might be to uh, generate your data on Archer, then transfer it to the RDF for safekeeping, and then transfer it to your own system from the RDF in order to do some post-processing or analysis or something of that nature. And if that's the case, then this 15 minute time to create the archive only needs to be done once. And yes, so these, uh, as I mentioned with the DAC and similarly with the serial queues on Archer, if you have a very long archiving process that you don't want to run interactively, you can use the serial queues to do so. So here are some uh, of the archiving utilities that are available on Archer in the RDF. Uh, there's TAR, which is perhaps the most common one, uh, CPIO, which I'm not going to talk about today because it's not particularly commonly used. Uh, but if anyone has any questions about that, it is described in some detail in the data transfer guide that I linked on one of the slides. And lastly, ZIP. ZIP is more commonly used on Windows, but uh, it works on Unix systems too and uh, is available on Archer. So there are some differences between uh, these utilities, there are some things that various ones do by default versus not. For example, TAR automatically archives files recursively, where CPIO does not. Uh, but in general, you will just want to use the one that you're most familiar with yourself, the, the one that you best know the, the options for. Uh, some of these will also automatically attempt to compress your data while archiving. It's generally recommended that you uh, you turn this option off if you can in order to speed up the archiving process. Uh, it tends to take more time to uh, compress the data than you will save during the transfer. So it's generally not worth it. So the first of these is TAR. Uh, so it comes with a uh, couple of options that are good to know. Uh, dash C for creating an archive. Uh, dash V is an optional parameter for uh, verbosely listing the files. So uh, this is an important one to know about because it can help to turn this one off. The reason for this is that uh, if you turn it on, it will, as each file is uh, inserted into the archive, the name of that file will be printed to standard out. Now this can be useful because it helps to see how far you are along in the uh, in the process of creating the archive, but uh, but it can hurt performance because that uh, time taken to print to screen uh, can actually be, add a significant amount of time onto the archive creation. Um, but it, in general, it, um, if it's not taking too long, it's nice to have on just so that you know if the, uh, the archive has stalled or if something has gone wrong. But uh, it's worth noting that it can be turned off. This shouldn't be an issue if you are using uh, one of the schedulers to, uh, to do this or the, uh, in a batch script. Um, but uh, if, if you are doing it interactively and every single file is being printed to screen, it can significantly affect performance. Uh, dash W will verify the archive after writing, so just make sure nothing has become corrupted and that all the data is there. Uh, dash L confirms that all the file uh, hard links are included in the archive, and uh, it will output a warning if not. And yes, as that, uh, Andy has just said there in chat, if you have minus V turned on, and it looks like it's stalled, that can be that uh, something is broken, but it can also just be that the next file that it's working on uh, is a particularly large one, is taking a long time to process. Uh, and then dash F, which tells it that the next uh, argument to the command is the name of the archive file that you want. 
um, in if you don't include this option then it will just print it directly to standard out so we have a uh, example command here with combining all of those options so this will take all the data in uh, the directory my data and archive it in a file called mydata.tar So then once you've created your archive and transferred it, you'll want to extract your data from the archive. And if we're using tar, then uh, the syntax is tar-xf. Uh, and then the, the name of your, uh, your archive file. So uh, the dash f is the same as before. It's just telling it that the, uh, the next option is the, is the tar file that you want to extract. And x is the uh, extraction option. You can use the dash D option to, uh, to diff or test a, an archive file against a set of data. Uh, so one thing that's important to note is that the original data has to be there for you to do this. You can't, uh, you can't check that the, uh, the archive data is valid if you don't have access to the original data. So this is because uh, tar does not store checksums for the files uh, so the only way for it to do the comparison is to have the original data present so that you can compare the two and uh, if the if the data in the directory that you pass it and the uh, data in the tar file do not match then as shown here oh i'm sorry i forgot to go on to the next slide uh, in Yes, as shown in this example here, uh, if something does not match, then a warning will be printed telling you which files don't match and uh, that don't match. In this example, it's that the, uh, the last time they were modified was different and that they are different sizes. Uh, so then we have zip, which is, uh, as I said, most commonly used on Windows. And its common options are uh, dash R for recursively archiving files and directories. Um, so yes, this is important if you have directories within directories. As I said before, tar does this by default, so you, you don't need to specify it. Uh, and then specify a compression level from zero to nine. And uh, as I was saying earlier about how in general compression isn't worth it. Uh, so because of this, we recommend that you use dash zero R Um, also worth noting that zip files do not preserve hard links, uh, unlike tar. And then we use a separate utility for extraction. So uh, from zip, instead of zip, we have unzip, uh, which is uh, quite straightforward, I think. Uh, and you can also use dash t to test the archive, which unlike tar does not need the original data to be present in order to work. Uh, so the zip file stores the CRC values. Uh, CRC stands for a cyclic redundancy check. And uh, it essentially uh, just has checksums for all the files and can verify that everything uh, matches what it should. So again, we see the, uh, the output from, in this case, a successful test of a zip file, uh, which shows that uh, everything is working as it should. Okay, so the next section is copying data between Archer and the RDF. So since uh, the RDF is mounted on uh, some of the same nodes as the, uh, the home file system, uh, you can copy things, uh, and indeed the work file system, you can copy things directly from Archer to the RDF as if it was a, uh, a local uh, copy on your own machine. So uh, CP is probably the most common one for, to use. Uh, again, in this example, you're, we're copying recursively from source to a, a destination on the EPSERC portion of the RDF. Another common one is rsync. I think I talked about briefly at the start about how it's important to make sure that it's something you actually 
want to use over uh, CP. So the, uh, one pro of rsync is that it will not attempt to transfer files that already exist, uh, which is obviously good because uh, that means uh, less data to transfer. But you do need to, it does need to do uh, a large amount of metadata operations in order to work out which data it needs to transfer, which can slow down performance. So CP, if you are just uh, if you are just copying data once from a uh, from your data on Archer to uh, say an empty directory on the RDF, it's probably going to uh, get better performance using CP rather than rsync. However, if you have a previously copy directly that you want to uh, resynchronize because some of the files have been updated, but uh, then rsync is likely going to be a better choice because it won't have to copy over all the uh, unchanged files. Uh, if you look up any guides on rsync, they will often tell you to uh, use minus Z or just have it by default in the example commands. And this uh, is the option that turns on compression, which, uh, as I said before, is usually something that you don't want. And lastly, it's important to remember that this has to be done on a node where the tool file systems are mounted. So that's the login nodes and the serial nodes. Uh, and essentially, this means not, not the compute nodes, not the service nodes, and not the data transfer nodes. So then moving on to transferring data uh, on and off the RDF uh, to or from your own machine. Uh, so in general, a lot of the same rules apply uh, in that you will usually want to archive your data if you have lots of small files into one large file. And you also probably don't want to uh, compress your data. So here are some of the utilities that you can use. Uh, you have the uh, SSH options, which are SCP, which is the SSH analog of CP, and rsync again. Uh, that if you if these if you're using these tools uh, but they're taking too long for your liking, then you may want to investigate uh, some of the other utilities for large transfers. Uh, Globus Online which uh, I will talk about in more detail later, and BBCP, which is a uh, command line utility that I am not going to cover in this, uh, in this talk, but it is available. There is uh, information available in it from the, uh, the data transfer guide that I linked near the beginning. Uh, the reason I'm not going to talk about it is that it can be, it can be quite finicky to use. Uh, it's, it can often give you quite a lot of trouble to get working. And in general, it's, it's not worth the hassle and it's better to use something like Globus Online. So uh, SSH tools. So uh, this is SCP and rsync. So uh, if you are uh, copying off the RDF, you should use the data transfer nodes that we talked about earlier because they are specifically designed for these things. Uh, SCP, the command is formatted identically to the CP command, but uh, the obvious difference here is that instead of just copying to a destination with a file path, you also need to uh, you also need to specify your username and the node uh, that you are copying to. So this SCP command shows uh, what you would use for copying from your local machine to a destination on the uh, on the RDF using one of the data transfer nodes. And yes, uh, in case you missed the link to the data management guide uh, in one of the earlier slides, Claire has just uh, linked it in the chat there. So then we have rsync. So rsync is the same utility that we uh, that we talked about before for local copies. Uh, the only difference in this case is that you specify the uh, that it's you're using SSH, uh, which is then using the dash e SSH option that you can see in that command there. And again, the uh, the command is formatted. The syntax is is identical to the uh, local copy command. Uh, 
So you can also transfer data directly off Archer, but there are no data transfer nodes on Archer, so you can uh, use these uh, serial queues or post-processing nodes. Uh, you can also, you can transfer small amounts of data directly just off the login node or, um, but uh, you should only do this with small amounts of data and certainly nothing that will require you to have good performance. Uh, it's also important that you can pull data off Archer directly from your local machine, but uh, pushing data off Archer to a local machine is not supported. And you'll find if you try to do this, that the, uh, the job will be killed soon after it starts. So uh, this is just a slide about uh, something you might do to improve your uh, performance over SSH. Uh, the S in the first S in SSH stands for security, and what that means is that all traffic is encrypted. Uh, so this often is is quite a, a good thing because if you want your data to be secure, but there is a performance penalty for doing so. Uh, so if, however, you don't care too much about security, if your data you're dealing with isn't particularly uh, sensitive then you can reduce the amount of encryption in order to improve your performance. So uh, both SCP and rsync have different options that you can select using dash C in order, to, uh, in order to choose the encryption algorithm you want to use. Uh, you can, if you uh, do some searching for uh, the man pages for SCP and rsync, they'll have uh, some of the algorithms that are available, but uh, the most important one for this is ARP4, which is the fastest one. So uh, yes, because of the trade-off, it's also the least secure, but it's, uh, again, if you are not too worried about the security of your data, uh, then it will be the, uh, it will give you the fastest performance. And again, uh, just to re-emphasize that if you have lots of small files, that uh, comes with lots of overhead, so it's important to, uh, to use an archiving tool to combine everything into a small number of large files where possible. Okay, so moving on to large transfers. So this is something you're going to want to look into if uh, SCP and rsync are uh, not capable of transferring data in the magnitude that you're looking for. Uh, so you can register for an account at globus.org. And essentially what Globus does is it uh, has two secure endpoints, one of which will be the uh, Archer or the RDF, and the other will be your own machine. Uh, and then it opens up a large number of parallel streams streams all the data through those and then pieces all the data together at the end. Uh, so this allows you to get uh, extremely high bandwidth, uh, but is it only really comes into uh, to play and being useful when you have a large amount of data. So you will need your RDF username and password in order to uh, gain access to the RDF endpoint on globus.org. And you'll also need to set up your own system as an M endpoint, which you can do using their website. It's uh, reasonably straightforward and easy to do. So uh, Globus Online uses Grid FTP, uh, which is a file transfer uh, protocol, uh, which has very good performance, but it is limited by one of two things. Uh, one is the network bandwidth between two endpoints. So if you have uh, two large servers at different locations, or if you uh, essentially if you are transferring between two machines that are uh, connected via Janet, then uh, you will have a very large bandwidth. Uh, but this can be uh, the bandwidth will end up being very small if the, at some point you are transferring something, say via Wi-Fi or Ethernet. 
So uh, Andy has just said in chat that you still need to be careful when pulling using rsync as this can start an rsync server process on the login node, even when you're running pulling from the remote end. So if you want to do long running rsync processes, then you're best running a push from the serial post processing nodes or using the RDF DTNs. Okay, yes, so, uh, so this is talking about uh, what I was mentioning earlier about how you can pull small amounts of data off Archer directly without using the serial uh, nodes or the uh, data transfer nodes. Uh, but if you do something that is uh, that runs for any significant length of time, it is likely to to get killed. Uh, so uh, back to Globus Online, the other thing that can limit performance is the storage access bandwidth. So uh, this essentially is uh, to do with the interaction with the file system. So uh, as I mentioned earlier about Lustre, Lustre is, has extremely high storage access bandwidth when you have a small amount of large files, but it is small for a, uh, a large amount of small files. And it will also be small for local storage, uh, which uh, you may have on your, your own machine. Uh, so it's important to make sure that if you are using uh, one of these tools, that you are not being overly limited by one of these factors. You also, as an alternative to Globus Online, you can use Grid FTP directly via the command line. This is usually more trouble than it's worth. Um, it it's, can be a lot of uh, trouble checking, and uh, uh, Globus takes care of a lot of the annoying things for you. So uh, you may have some reasons to want to use Grid FTP, but if you, if you don't have a specific reason why you want to do this yourself, it is almost certainly going to be much less hassle for you to use Globus Online. Okay, so uh, just a summary of uh, what we talked about today. Uh, so the RDF is mounted directly on the Archer login nodes, and uh, it has data transfer nodes uh, available for remote transfers. Uh, as yeah, oh, as Andy says in the chat, sometimes the endpoint you want to go to will not support Globus Online. Uh, so that if that's the case, then yes, you're. Uh, you may want to use one of the other tools. Uh, archiving improves performance for copying and transferring. So again, just to, to really hammer this point home, large amounts of files in result in, uh, in very poor performance. Make sure that if you have a large amount of data spread across many, many files that you archive it into one large file before doing your transfers. Uh, so beware of compression in rsync, which can lead you to being bottlenecked by your CPU, in, uh, which um, the CPU performance may not be particularly fast, especially compared to the network uh, bandwidth. And use the minus Z option in order to avoid this. Uh, similarly to uh, compression, you tend to want to avoid encryption, uh, which again can bottleneck on CPU performance, use ARC4, which is the uh, the least computationally intense encryption uh, available and also the least secure. And use Globus Online if you can for best performance for very large data transfers. And lastly, be aware of the weakest link in your data transfer chain so that uh, you know which tools you can make the best use of. There is uh, no need to, uh, or you will not get any use out of something which uh, is capable of uh, using multiple parallel file streams if at the end of the day it all has to go through your Wi Fi connection. And yes, as, uh, as Andy notes, the Globus Online data transfers are unencrypted. So the security is done by verifying the endpoints, but the streams in between them are, are unencrypted. And lastly, if uh, you have uh, problems using any of these tools that I mentioned on, uh, on Archer or the RDF, uh, then you can contact the Archer help desk at support at archer.ac.uk, uh, where we'll be able to provide you with support with any problems you're having here. 
so uh, that's all I had to cover. So I'll I'll wait around for a little while and see uh, if anyone has any any questions that they want to ask. So for anyone watching the video who doesn't have access to the chat, Doug has asked, what is the switch off date for the RDF? Is it still the 18th of February, 2020? And uh, the answer from Lorna is that uh, for NERC, you need to remove your data from the RDF by the 18th of February, because it will be removed after that. And uh, EPSERC, EPSERC are retaining the RDF, so data on uh, slash EPSERC will be retained. So just to summarize some of the answers that Lorna has been writing in chat, some of the questions. Uh, Archer is still going to be available to all users after the 18th of February. Um, this is uh, despite the fact that NERC users do need to remove their data from the RDF before then. They will still be able to use Archer. And uh, slash general on the RDF is going to be retained, but some of the older projects uh, are going to be cleaned up so you can email Lorna uh, if you're not sure and she can check and make sure uh, whether your data will be retained or not. And yes, as Claire says, maybe better to just email the Archer help desk at support at archer.ac.uk instead of emailing Lorna directly. So Krishna asks if uh, EPSERC will have the same permissions when mounted on Archer 2. And uh, the answer to that from Andy is that we don't know enough about Archer 2 yet to know if the EPSERC data on the RDF will be mounted directly. So the next question is, will we have access to the RDF directly when Archer is down? And the answer is that yes, EPSERC in general uh, data will be available throughout the downtime. But as uh, stated previously, NERC is going to be uh, wiped on the 18th of February. Okay, so that seems to be uh, all the questions coming from chat. So uh, thank you all for listening to this webinar. Uh, as I said earlier, the slide and the video will be available on the Archer website and the, uh, and the video will be available on the Archer YouTube channel. Thank you.